Today we're going to be learning Beitza Daf Yud Chet. This is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start at the very bottom of Yud Zayin Amubet, at the part where the Gemara starts. So we saw it yesterday in the Mishnah about doing tefillah. Can you, a person, can go to the mikvah according to Beit Hill and not according to Beit Shammai if they're supposed to go to the mikvah on Shabbat, right? We're talking about Shabbat is right before the regal, right? The idea is that people want to get ready for the holiday and preparation for the holiday was going to the mikvah because they were going to the temple and they were going to eat sacrificial meat, et cetera. So can they do it on Shabbat or do they have to do it before Shabbat? So, and what about utensils? Because also they needed pure utensils. So we said that nobody thinks that you can purify utensils. The debate is really about whether a person can purify himself or not. Um, so Beit Shammai says you have to do everything before Shabbat. And Beit Hillel says, no, you can do, a person can be tovel on Shabbat. So the Gemara starts off and says, Everybody agrees that you can't use a vessel on Shabbat. You can't tovel it in a mikvah. My time, oh, what's the reason? So why can't you tovel a vessel on Shabbat? And presumably, we're going to be saying also on Yom Tov. Okay, so why not? I'm a rabbi. We'll, we'll see about Yom Tov. There's a bit of a distinction between cases and we'll get to that. But basically, right now we're starting with Shabbat, but we'll get to Yom Tov in a minute. So Rabbah says, We're worried you're going to take it, if we allow you to tovel keling, to go to the mikvah and purify vessels, then, right, don't confuse this with what we do in the mikvah today, although we're going to get there. I'm going to talk about it, even though the Gemara doesn't talk about it. That's different. Here we're talking about Vessels that became impure that you want to purify. But we, tovel vessels, that's something different. That's if you buy a vessel that wasn't owned by a Jew or created by a Jew, then you need to, was it built by a Jew, then you need to actually tovel it. That's a whole different story, but it's a little bit similar here about whether you could do that on Yantif or not, let's say. So they say the concern is we're worried you're going to carry four Amod and Meshud Rabim because once we allow you to, have, to tovel a kli, well, you'll have to get to the mikvah, but you might carry it. This is classic Rabbah. Remember, he's the one who says by Lula and by Shofar and a whole bunch of other cases that he's always worried. Maybe you'll carry something for Amod and Meshud Rabim, and therefore he forbids all sorts of things. Amal Abai, Abai says, but wait, if you're worried about carrying, so how about Yeshlo Bor Let's say you have a mikvah in your house. You have a pit, right, with fresh water. And Ma'ikala Memar, so can't you then tovel your kalim? You don't, certainly don't have to worry, you're going to carry it in public. Well, we're going to forbid you, since you can't do it in public, because maybe you'll carry it for Amadur Meshadar Therefore, we don't allow you to do it in private, because then maybe you'll do it in public. And if you do it in public, you'll come to carry for Amadur Meshadar Abi. That's a little bit of a question here because this is what we call exera and exera. The Gemara is going to ask it, not in those words exactly, but they're going to say, the Gemara is going to have a whole slew of questions on him about his exera. So we'll get to that in another minute. But then they say another thing, which is, Hatinach Shabbat. So I understand Shabbat because maybe I'll carry it. But Yom Tov Ma'ika Lamebar, but what about Yom Tov? Why, why would it be forbidden then to tovel a on Yom Tov? Because you certainly don't have a carrying issue. It's not forbidden to carry so, so, well, Yantif is Asr because Shabbat is Asr. If we allow you to do it on Yantif, you'll do it on Shabbat. If we allow you to do it on Shabbat, you'll carry it for Amod and Rashid Rabim. And that's a problem. I'll already tell you now, there's four different answers as to why it's forbidden on Shabbat and presumably Yom Tov. And this is just the first, Rabbah, who says we're worried you're going to carry it. And then we seem to have this Gzera on the Gzera that we're saying Yom Tov is forbidden because of that, right? So that you won't do it on Shabbat, so that you might end up carrying it. And also we say in private, it's still forbidden because then maybe you'll go to do it in public. To which the Gemara asks, Umigas Rinan, do we really make a Xera like that? Because if we do, we're going to give you five other cases where theoretically it should be just like this and we don't make a Xera, okay? Where there's another reason to say, well, let's forbid this because something else is forbidden because of a Xera. And then, right, it's like a Xera and a Xera. And we're going to see in none of those cases, do we have a Xera? And if so, why are we doing it here? And each time the Gemara is going to answer, that's different. So here goes our beginning of our five questions. The Hatnan, doesn't it say in the Mishnah, our Mishnah? What did we learn? That if you have water, we're going to see now it's the only water you have. You have no drinking water. Otherwise, you could drink the water from the mikvah, but the mikvah water must be salty and not so good. So what are you allowed to do? You put it in a, in a clay oven, which can't, it's not susceptible to impurity. 
you lower it down into the mikvah. As soon as the mikvah water touches your water without kind of getting it and contaminating it and spilling all in, but as soon as it touches it, just by touching, that's called hashaka, it already purifies the water. So if that's the case, that's allowed. But lomat bilim, but you can't take, you're going to see what this means later, but you can't take an impure vessel, put your water, your impure water in an impure vessel, put it in the mikvah and say, look, my water now touched the mikveh and that's pure. And my kli, my utensil that was impure, now touched what went under, was submerged in the mikveh and is now pure. Not allowed to do that. So the Gemara asked the obvious question. Im if we make a of yantif because of Shabbat, why don't we say, nigzor hashaka, atu atbala. If atbala is forbidden, why don't we, right, if dipping it in the mikveh and you know, purifying your vessel is permitted, is forbidden, why do we permit this putting the water in. Maybe you'll end up saying, oh, well, if I put my water in my pure vessel, I could also put my water, my impure, my water in my impure vessel and I can purify the water. I can purify the utensil, sorry, purify the bowl. So if that's the case, why don't we? Lamar says, Tis you really want to learn from there? You wouldn't bother doing this hashaka if you had other water, right? If I have plenty of drinking water, I wouldn't start going through this process to fix my water and make it pure if I already had other pure water. So it must be, I have no other pure water. This was my only water. Now, if this was my only water, the Gemara says, Ella delately, it must be, I don't have any other water. But Kevin delately, Ms. Hazari, if I only have a little bit of water, right? What ended up happening here? For young, if I ended up with a teeny bit of water and it was impure, how likely is that to happen? That I have so little water, if I have so little water, it's very unlikely I'm going to let it become impure because I'm going to make sure that water stays pure. And therefore, the likelihood of having impure water that needs purification, and yantif, that that's your only water is so unlikely that if the likelihood is so limited and there's such a small likelihood of it happening, then we always say that's exera. Okay, the Gemara doesn't say it here, but it's what's underlying. And we're going to see it in, in the question number three that it's a milta de lo shricha, it's something that's very uncommon. And milta de lo shricha lo gazru ba rabbanan. There's general rules about gzerot de rabbanan, right? ordinances the rabbis institute, they don't institute an ordinance if it's something super uncommon. So that's why this is not an issue. Eitibay, question number two. Madalim bitlitame, butaho. What you can do though is you can put a bucket, if you wanna draw water from a well, you can use, and you have, if you have a utensil you want to purify that you really need on Yantif, so what do you do? You lower it down into the well to take out water from the well for drinking. It's not the same as Hashaka where you're fixing the water. Here, you lower it down this bucket into the well, and right in the well is your mikvah, and it's impure when you pick it up, right? You have it now full of water, and it became pure. Then eat up. We're worried about these ordinances. We make an ordinance on an ordinance. Then, nigzor doma atilet bule Why don't we say it's forbidden because if we allow you to do it that way, maybe you'll think that you can actually tovel it some other way, which you can't. So what do they answer? It's going to be two types of answers here. Either it's something super uncommon, which is the first answer, or this answer, which is going to be, since we only allow you to purify the kli by dunking it in the water in order to draw water from the well, right, from the mikvah, since that's the only way it's allowed to do it, everyone will know. In other words, that's not your typical way that you're going to tovel a kli. You have to tovel a utensil. You dunk it in the mikveh and take it out. Since we're only permitting you to do it in this kind of way, it seems clear that you're going to know that it's only permitted this way, and you're not going to think that I can go dunking other utensils in the mikveh if I wanted to. Question number three, a yom tov. If you have something that became pure on Erev Yom tov, now we're going to learn about Yom Tov, that it's forbidden to take a kli that was impure yesterday, and now you want to tovel it on Yom Tov. But by Yom Tov, if it became impure on Yom Tov, and you have to add that you need it on Yom Tov, okay, then you're allowed to, to tovel it on Yom Tov. So, in Ita, again, if we're going to make zero, nigzor de Yom Tov, atu de Erev Yom Tov. So we should forbid Yom Tov because of Erev Yom Tov. We allow something that was it was in, it became impure on Yantif, then you might think that you could also tovel a kli that became impure Erev Yantif. So therefore, why not? Look, you see here, we don't make zerot on zerot. So the answer, just like an answer in question number one, we answered this, 
It's very uncommon. They didn't make an ordinance on something that was totally uncommon. It's very uncommon. Why is it uncommon? Exactly for the reason where we started. People generally purify themselves before the holiday. So it was unlikely that something would become impure on the holiday itself. Question number four. Etibay. Klishen itma ba'avatuma. Okay, this goes back to all our levels of, of impurity. An avatuma, right, like a sheretz. So something that became nitma ba'avatuma, meaning the object now becomes a rishon, and it can cause water, drinks, food items that you put in that vessel to become impure, become a sheni lituma. So if it's nitma ba'avatuma, meaning it's a rishon, ein matbilin otobiyonto. You can't put that in a mitvan yonto. But bivlada tuma, if it became from a sheni, from a rishon, meaning a rishon got it impure, it's now a sheni, this utensil. You can put it in the mikvan yom tov, vim ita. Now, why are we, right? If we're worried, don't permit this because you might come to think other things are permitted. Well, nigs or ha, to ha, we should say, even if it's a sheni lituma and it became impure from a rishon, we still should forbid it because then you might come to permit a rishon lituma. So, what do they answer? But if you have a vessel that's a shani, it can only make food and drink into a shlishi. Now, food and shlishi is usually irrelevant, only is a problem for truma and kochin, but not for normal foods. So if that's the case, it's really only relevant to koanim who eat the truma and the kochin. So if that's the case, it's gabe koanim, and koanim is reason him. Again, this is like the answer to question number two. Since we only allow in a particular way, we're not worried that you're going to mess up. Here, if it only relates to Kaanim, we're not worried they're going to mess up because Kaanim know all the laws. They're much more careful. Again, this wasn't always the truth, but even the truth is even Kaanim, particularly, even like when they were stuking Kaanim, they were very careful about purity and impurity laws, maybe not about some other things. Fifth question, fifth and last one, Tashma, to Amarav Chia Barashi Amarav, Nida She'en Labagadim, if a woman who's in Nida and doesn't have clothes that are pure and she's about to purify herself in the mikvah and she wants to wear clothes that are pure because her clothes also would become impure when she was in Nida. What does she do? She goes into the mikvah with her clothes on. Okay, they have to be loose. Otherwise, it would be a chatzitza. But if you go in the mikvah with very loose clothing and the water could get underneath, then it's fine. So she goes in the mikvah with very loose clothing. Vim ita, if we're worried about, if you permit this, you might come to permit other things. And therefore, we should forbid it. We should forbid her to go with her with her clothes because maybe she'll think that if she could go in with her clothes on and purify her clothes, then maybe she could also just purify, purify her clothes normally. Now, obviously, the answer to this is just like with the bucket, which is it's not normally the way you do it that you go to the mikvah with your clothes on in order to purify your clothes. So the fact that we permit her to do that means that she's going to know that it's only permitted for this purpose and not for any other reason. Okay. That was, again, all within Rabbah who said, it's a Shabbat. You might end up carrying it in the public domain. And Yom Tov, they were goes there because of Shabbat. And private, they were goes there, you know, so that you don't do it in public. Second answer, Rav Yosef Amar, Gzera Mishum Schita, we're worried if we allow you to tovel, let's say clothing, for example, you might come to squeeze them out. And that's a toladav dash of threshing, right? Taking something out from inside, squeezing the water out of the clothing. So that's the problem. So Amar Le'abaye, Tinach Kelim de B'nei Schita Ninu, Kelim de la B'nei Schita Ninu Ma'ika So that makes sense if you're talking about clothing. But what if you have a cup? Cup, you can't squeeze. So there's no concern. You might squeeze the cup. So what do we say about that? So again, we have a gzera because of schita, and then we're gonna be goes there on other things that it doesn't apply to, just in case we allow that. People will think that you can do other, you can use clothes, and the clothes you might come to ring out. To which the Gemara says, So now we go back and ask the same five questions on Rav Yosef that we asked on Raba, because again, he's making a gzera on a gzera. And Shane Le Kedishanina. And in the end, they answered it the same way they answered it. And that's the end. They don't go through them all. They just tell you, oh, and they asked him all the same questions. And he could answer it the same way that Rabbi did. Third answer. Maybe you'll leave it to do Anyantif, right? How many times? We don't have time during the week. We're so busy. But Anyantif for Shabbat, all of a sudden we have time. So maybe you'll leave your Kaleen to Tovel Anyantif if we allow it. We don't want people pushing things off 
just to do them on Yantif. We only allow things on Yantif that you couldn't have done before. So Tanya Kavateh de Bibi, we're going to bring a bright to prove his, his reason. They say exactly the reason he says, so there's a bright to prove his reason. Answer number four, final answer. Rava Amal, right, we're going to, like I said, four different approaches to why it's forbidden. Rava Amar, it looks like you're fixing the utensil, okay, because before it was impure, now you're making it pure. That's kind of like fixing a utensil. It's like building, right? When you finish making your utensil, it's called Makebe Patish. You put the final blow on and it's now ready for use. So it's like that. But if you're going to say it looks like you're fixing something, Adam Nami, then a person also shouldn't be allowed to go to the mikvah because you're also fixing. So what do they say? Well, putting a vessel in a mikvah looks like you're fixing the vessel, but a person going into a mikvah looks like what? Adam It looks like you're just rinsing yourself off. Remember, they were going in public streams, right? So it just looks like you're rinsing yourself off to cool off. So therefore, we're not worried about an Adam. We're going to have a whole slew of questions on this. But before we do that, I want to get back to something I mentioned before, which is I wanted to make this comparison to the way we do Tefillat Kelim today. And would the same issues apply when it comes to Tovaling Akli today than it did then? Again, the Tefillah is the same action, but it's a very different meaning. Right? There, here we do it because you're fixing, you're taking away the impurity. And there it's because it was in Gentile hands and we have to basically put in a mikvah, right? It's, it's a little less clear exactly the whole, mikvah. I'm not gonna get into all the reasons there, but anyway, we do mikvah for a bit of a different reason and we're not fixing the kli in the same kind of way, but maybe it is a little bit. So the Gemara says, uh, sorry, the Shulchan Aruch says, okay, I'm reading in Shin Kaf Gimel in Or Chaim. Mutar lahadbil kli chadash ha'ta'un You're actually allowed to, um, this is even on Shabbat, by the way. You can tovel a new, brand new kli on Shabbat. V'yesh oslim. However, there are some who say, no, you can't. And it's based on, do we look at this? Is, are we like doing a tikkun kli? Is it the same as toveling an impure vessel? kulam. Here's the interesting part. He says, if you want to be yotze, what do you do? Kli la'akum b'matana. Give it to a non-Jew as a gift. V'yachzor v'yashilenu mimenu. And then borrow it back from him. And then you can avoid tefillah entirely. And that's what you should do if you need this vessel on Shabbat or Yom Tov. The Ramah adds, and this is why I wanted to add it, because he obviously is adding this based on our Gemara. If it's a vessel that you could use for filling up water, then you right? We don't want it to look like you're fixing the kli, but if you just look like you're drawing water, but you can actually fix it that way, then you can do it in that way. And that's exactly what we saw before. So there you have, right, our Gemara at play in Halacha Lamas. Okay, now let's get back to our questions. So if we say a person is allowed to tovel because it looks like he's cooling off, well, that makes sense if the water's nice, clear water. Someone's going to swim, you know, to cool off. But what about Disgusting water, right? Sometimes mikvah water is dirty. Still, technically mikvah water, but you would never really rinse off there. So, sometimes somebody comes in a big heat wave, and it's so hot that he'll go bathing even in flax water, okay? Disgusting water. If it's really hot, you're desperate. You'll go in anything. And right? how many people go to Mayanot in Israel, right? Where they're, sometimes they're kind of disgusting, but people are hot in the summer and they don't really care. Tinach b'yimorachama. Okay, fine. Well, that resolves it only in the summer months. But b'yimorach shemi ma'yikalamem, or what about in the winter months when it's freezing? Nobody's going in that water for any reason other than mikvah. Then it looks like you're fixing yourself. So amarav nachem bar yitzchak, pa'amim sh'adam ba min asadem eluklach betitu betzoah. Sometimes you come back from the fields full of dirt, and feces, even disgusting things. The rochets are feeling about akshamim, and you might actually go in the water even in the winter. So yeah, people do. You have to remember, they never running water, they never showers, right? They used public, public streams and things for washing. So now they say, okay, fine. So we sort of resolve that. Maybe not the most convincing, but okay. Tinach b'shabat But nobody's going to swim on, Yan, on Yom Kippur. You can't do that on Yom Kippur. So if you see someone in Yom Kippur, it's clear they're going to the mikvah and then it's mitakein. So it's a problem. So what do we say there? Amarava, mi ikamidi de b'shabat shari, Rava says this very interesting line. 
Shabbat is more strict than Yom Kippur. Now, it's true there are certain things that are forbidden on Yom Kippur, but those are things that are Yom Kippur related, like washing, um, um, uh, you know, all the eating, drinking, all that, okay? Sexual relations, that's all wearing shoes. That's one category. But if we're talking about things that are wrong to do, like because of malacha, because metak and kli and all that, we're going to say that Shabbos is less strict than Yom Kippur. It doesn't make any sense. So Ella Ho'ilu b'Shabbat Shari b'Yom Kippurim Nami Shabbos. So he says, since Ho'il, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Ho'il is a is a use of saying since it's permitted here, we permit it there. We've seen this before. Um, we saw it in Pesachim about this Ho'il. Like if you're already cooking for Yantiv, you can add more in case guests come, and you know certain things. Since it's allowed there, we're going to allow it somewhere else. Or since something might happen, we allow something else. So the Gemara asks, okay, that's Rava's explanation. But wait. Does he really hold by this Hoel thing? We're going to prove from some other source that Rava doesn't hold by Hoel. So how could he say Hoel here if he doesn't hold by it elsewhere? So the topic is medicine on Shabbat. You have a toothache and you want to eat something to, you want to put vinegar in your mouth to sip vinegar in order to heal your tooth. So normally you can't do things for medicinal purposes. The rabbis decreed that you're not allowed to, unless you come to grind up spices and stuff medication, which is grinding is forbidden. So the Hatsanan, doesn't it say in the Mishnah, okay, medicine under certain circumstances is permitted. I'm not going to get into all that, but overall basic things, it's not dangerous or whatever. Again, I'm not going to get into all the issues there, but basic medicine, no. You can't sip vinegar. Okay. You can dip your bread into vinegar like people do normally and eat it. And then if the vinegar then seeps into your teeth and it helps you, great. That's the Mishnah. But there's a contradiction to that Mishnah. It says in a bright time, you can't sip the vinegar and spit it out like gargling with it. But you can sip it and swallow it. So there you have a contradiction. How can you say you can sit and swallow it when the Mishnah said you can't sip it at all? So Amar Abaye, we're going to have a bias resolution and Ravas. Ravas is the one that's going to interest us, but in the meantime, first let's see Abaye. Kitna nami matnitim, megame upoletna. When the Mishnah said, lo yigame behenet hachomet, it meant don't sip and spit out, don't gargle it. It didn't mean don't sip and swallow, that you can do. That's not, right? That's a, a particular reading of the Mishnah. The rabbi I'll explain it. Even if the Mishnah said you can't put the sip it and swallow it, I'll explain the Mishnah and the Bright are both talking about two different cases. The Lokasha, Kan Kodem Tibu, Kan Lachar Tibu. One is before you dipped your bread in the vinegar. Then, now the whole issue here is you can do medicine if you're drinking something that people normally drink. So normally people would drink before they ate. They would sometimes sip some vinegar before they dip their bread in it. But after the meal, no one would ever do that. So now here comes the clincher. So basically, we're going to say before you dip, you're allowed to. That's the brighta. And the Mishnah that says you can't is after you already dipped. Vim ita. And if really we say, Rava says, ho'il, what would you say? Nema ho'il the kodem tibul shari, lachar tibul nami shari. You would say, since you're allowed to do it after, the same action should be then permitted earlier, just like since it's for permitted on Shabbat. You can also go to the mikvah on Yom, Yom Kippur. Same thing here. Since you can swallow the sip and swallow the vinegar before your meal, you should be allowed to then do it after the meal, even though people don't normally do that. So what's the Gemara's answer? He must have changed his mind about the vinegar and agree with Abayah's resolution that the Mishnah is really talking about only gargling and not swallowing. And swallowing would be permitted by the bright. So he must have changed his mind, which the Gemara says, Dilma meha hadrabe. How do you, uh, Dilma meha hadrabe. How do you know that he changed his mind about the vinegar? Maybe he changed his mind about the Yom Kippur thing. Maybe he doesn't permit it on Yom Kippur if he doesn't say ho'il. So the answer, Los it's unlikely. Detanya, as it says in a bright, and likely he's not going to disagree with a bright, Anyone who has to go to the mikveh, if it's your day to go to the mikveh on Yom Kippur or on Tisha B'av, you go to the mikveh, even, right, you go to the mikveh normally, whether it's Tisha B'av, whether it's Yom Kippur. Okay, we no longer do this anymore. We actually learned this whole thing in another sugya. Um, let's try to see where it is because I don't remember offhand. Say it was in Shabbat, ah, yeah, Yoma. We learned it at the end of Masechet Yoma. Okay. 
um, when we talked about tefillah on Yom Kippur, it was actually in the last daf. Okay, so you can go back there and see the, the, what we talked about then about why nowadays do we not go to the mikveh anymore on Yom Kippur. Vishavin. Okay, that's the end of that section. So again, just to briefly summarize, we saw four reasons why you can't go to the mikvah on Yantif and Shabbat. Okay, is it Zera, Shema Yitzlana Biyado Arba Mode, and then Yom Tovatu Shabbat? Is it because of Srita, of squeezing? Is it? And then even if it's not something that's squeezed, still then we'll come to, you might come to permit things that do get squeezed. And Gzera Shema Yashet, maybe you'll leave it for Yantif, or it looks like you're Metakin Kli, to which we then just said, what's the difference between that and a person? Okay, plus when it came to the Gzera and the Gzera, we had a whole slew of questions. Why aren't we Gzera in other cases? And for each five of the five cases, we had an answer as to why that case was different than this and why there would be no reason to make the Gzera there, but there is still a reason in our case. Now we're going to this line of the Mishnah of Shavin Shemashkin et Hamayim Bekle Evan. Okay, you can't, Mishikin, sorry, you're allowed to do hashaka, touching the water to the mikveh in order to purify the water. In kleavani, right? In stone vessels, which aren't susceptible to impurity. But lomat bilim, but you can't tovel a kli in this way. So ma, ma lomat bilim, what does that mean? Samar Shmuel, it's exactly what we described before. Ein mat bilim is a kli, agav meimav letaro biyom. You can't use a, in, an impure vessel and tovel it with the water at the same time and have it become pure. Ditanya, how do we know? This is, says in a brighta. Oh, sorry, no, I skipped a line. Mani matnitin lo rebi lo rabbanan. According to is our Mishnah though, it doesn't sound like it matches rebi and it doesn't sound like it matches rabbanan as we're gonna see in the following brighta. Ditanya. So our Mishnah permitted the hashaka, didn't permit tefillah, right? Um, purifying the vessel. Okay, this sounds like our Mishnah. You can't dunk it in, right, to purify the water. Uh, sorry, to purify the kli with the water, the vessel. And you can't even do hashaka, fix the water in a vessel that's not, that's not impure. Divrei Rebbe. So you see, the first part of Rebbe matches the Mishnah, but the second part doesn't. Chachamim permit both. So Rebbe forbids both. Chachamim permit both. And our Mishnah forbade one, permitted one. So it doesn't match either of them. Mani. E Rebbe kashya shaka. If it's Rebbe, well then hashaka doesn't make sense because Rebbe says you can't do hashaka. And E Rabbanan kashya balan. If it's the rabbis, they say you can use it, you know, put a, a, an impure vessel and it will become pure. And our Mishnah says you can't. So, Ibai Dema Rebbe, Ibai Dema Rabbanam, we're now going to explain it according to both. Ibai Dema Rebbe, you could say, and there's a little bit of a hard explanation, but we're going to split what Rebbe says in the Brayta into two. He says two things, both are forbidden, but each time he's talking about either Shabbat or, or Yom Tov. Reisha de Brayta be Yom Tov. On Yom Tov, ein matbilin atake akli al gav meimah. But, ein mishikin atamayim bekli even is talking about Shabbat. Seifa be Shabbat. And and then you'd have to say, even though the topic of our Mishnah really was Shabbat when it comes out in Erev Yantif, but would say that line, Mishikimatamayim, is only Yantif and not Shabbat. Then we have no contradiction. However, it required us to take these two lines that Rebbe said that were right next to each other and say each one is talking about either Shabbat, one is Shabbat, one is Yom Tov. It's a little tricky to say that. The Shabbat. You could say, the Mishnah works with Rabbanan, and the Mishnah is only talking about Shabbat, and the Brayta was only talking about Yom Tov, and therefore we resolve it by saying the Brayta is all about Yom Tov. Yom Tov both are permitted according to the rabbis, and on Shabbat we're going to forbid both because we're going to split between Shabbat and Yom Tov. And with that, we finish for today, and have a Shabbat Shalom or Shavuot Tov. We will meet back up again on Sunday.